じゃあ、えー、とぼちぼち始めていきましょう。OK、uh,、So then、uh, let's start the first、uh, five strips, streams of,、uh, of this lecture series.、Uh, it's for optical coherence tomography. And I named it as a principle and、uh, implementation of Fourier domain optical coherence tomography. And actually,、uh, this Fourier domain is one of the key ones. I'm going、uh, to explain later. Okay,、uh, before starting this lecture, I would like to first give a structure of the entire series of this lecture. And this lecture can be split into two parts. The first part is the principle and the application of the optical coherence tomography. And、uh, this might be the, the exactly the interest of you guys, right? You three, maybe.、Uh, also,、uh, some guys are、uh, listening it,、uh, mainly from China.、Uh, uh, there were some, some、uh, research students who cannot come.、Uh, Uh, to, to the University of Tsukuba at this moment, but、uh, they are still suspended, but、uh, will soon come. And I would like them to prepare for,、uh, for studying their real research. So、uh, that's actually the purpose of why I decided to give in this lecture in English. Okay.、Uh, the second part is uh, uh, it's rather a general skill. It is for, the,、uh, I, I named it the five steps for critical reading of scientific papers. And this one is, I, I actually explain.、Uh, okay. so The students are normally believing they can read the papers, but I think it's not really true.、Uh, like, it's quite simple read the word and the read a sentence, and a、uh, few understand. Okay, okay, I got it. It's perfect. And then cast that a question and no answer. It's quite a typical situation, right? And I would like to、uh, say rectify this situation. I just break down the way I'm reading the paper critically into five steps. And, and, uh, and the first step is a quite, quite simple how you can read the paper word by word. And it's very practical using a color marker, the four color markers, the blue, and yellow, green, and red, and highlight the word, blah, blah, blah. It's quite simple, right? And then uh, gradually, uh, I explain、uh, more, say, abstract tips, like、uh, making、uh, a short summary of each paragraph, and, and then, uh, then uh, coming to the logic. Follow the logic of the paper and、uh, criticize it. And、uh, finally, okay, the fifth step is the criticism. Just、uh, follow and check the fact and logic and、uh, find out、uh, which part is still open. Okay, and then constructively read that the really the final, final step. You can add something by reading the paper. So uh, for the, uh, the second half of this lecture is dedicated for these five steps. So maybe after taking this lecture, maybe you can add something by reading the paper. Okay, that's the goal. Okay,、uh, in, anyway,、uh, for these upcoming five lectures, are going to be dedicated for the optical coherence tomography. And let me start today for this first part. And this first part is going to be split into further split into five, five sections. The lecture one is、uh, of the introduction and the principles of optical coherence tomography. And the lecture two is、uh, its implementation. Okay, the lecture one, I'm going to talk about the principle, and then lecture two, in the lecture two, I'm going to talk about the practical implementation. And lecture three, I will talk about a little bit more theory to optimize the optical coherence tomography.、Uh, uh, technically, uh, lecture three and lecture four, both of them are dedicated for the optimization. Now, lecture three, I'm going to talk about the theories and the practice of、uh, resolution and sensitivity of the system. And lecture four, I'm going to、uh, talk about how you can select the proper wavelength of the system. And also,、uh, how we can,、uh, I'm going to talk about how we can determine the depth range of the measurement depth range of the system. The OCD is actually the imaging system. I'm going to talk about it today. Okay. And in lecture five, I'm going to talk about the application. Uh, OCT itself has already been a long time been used in、uh, clinical field, medicine, and a clinic. And I'm going to a little bit talk about the application, how the OCD is used in a society, in a world. Okay. So then、uh, today is actually lecture one. And let me start from the lecture one. Okay.、Uh, to start in the lecture one,、uh, first, I would, like to,、uh, I would like you to have grabbed some basic idea of the optical coherence tomography, or OCT in short. Okay. OCT. Is、uh, in general, it's a low coherence interferometer. So, for this low coherence, it, it's an interferometer, light interferometer. But for this, we are going to use the light source with the low temporal coherence. Means it's broadband. 
its wavelength band, or uh, the wavelength width of the band is quite wide, wider than a standard light. Uh, maybe uh, in a, uh, say, student experiment, you then use the helium neon laser. So this kind of laser has a very, very narrow band width, and it has a very long coherent length. Okay, the, uh, the light impinges from the light and are split into two and uh, combine it again. Uh, even this distance, a uh, difference of this distance of the two paths of the light are so different, still we can see the interference range. Uh, okay, uh, just, re uh, just remember what you did in a student experiment. Maybe you didn't do uh, that much careful alignment of the, the, uh, the, in, uh, the interferometer, but uh, still you can see the fringe. It is because uh, normally laser has a very long coherence length uh, or a long temporal coherence length. This means the bandwidth of the light source is quite, quite narrow, okay? Uh, but in comparison to coherence tomography, it's a low coherence interferometer. It has a very broad band a light source. So then what's going to be happened? The light is coming from the light source and split into two by the beam splitter and then reflected back by the mirrors and then uh, combined it again. And now the light source, uh, please be reminded that the light source is broadband. So this means it localizes in time, okay? It's uncertainty, the, uh, say, Wavelength for the frequency of the light is the energy, right? The frequency of the light is in proportional to the energy of the photon. Okay, and if energy is wide, it's going to be localized in time. It's uncertainty. So this means the light of photon locally exists in one point. It's just like a particle. Okay, uh, don't be confused. This is not a photon. Uh, I mean, the photon particle, uh, I mean, uh, this particle doesn't mean the photon particle, but uh, this particle means the localization, temporal localization of the light, or say coherence. We call it as a coherence. And this coherence is split into two and uh, combined it again. Okay, this is something happened. So if on the helium neon laser, the light is something like a wave. You can think uh, like a light is a wave and even split it and combine it with a different timing. We, we can have uh, some overlapping of the waves, right? And the, the reason why we have an interference signal in, uh, we, even with a very long, um, say, path length difference. But in a case of uh, local human interferometer, we need the exact matching of two paths of the interferometer. Okay, and then what's going to happen if one of the light, uh, or sorry, the, the light path shifts or uh, elongated? We don't have a real combination. And we don't have an interference. Okay, let's check it again. If the, the uh, path lengths are the same, we have the, the uh, in, in this case, in this example, constructive interference. And, or, but uh, if slightly changed, and, uh, okay, the mirror is slightly, slightly, slightly shifted within the wavelength, for example. Uh, sometimes we are going to have a destructive interference. The beam intensity becomes uh, smaller than the summation of the two beam intensity of the two beams. Okay, so and this means uh, by the slightly changing the, the say mirror, one of the mirror, we are going to have the oscillation of the intensity, that the interference. Okay, but if on uh, the one of the path lengths is uh, broadly uh, different from the others, we don't have any interference. So the light intensity at the detector here is uh, uh, very, very stable. Okay. By using it, actually, uh, we can take on uh, the scattering profile of the sample along the depth, the depth resolution. Okay. We can replace one of the mirror to a sample to be measured. Uh, in, in the case of optical coherence tomography, uh, one of the measured sample is the eye, human eye, living human eye. So uh, this picture uh, shows the extracted eye, but in reality, we put our chin on a chin rest and the light impinges to our eye, right? 
and then we can have the, the say depth resolved signal or the structure of the eye. And for this, we shift this mirror by time. Okay, and if uh, the light is reflected from the eye at a particular moment, and on that time, if the mirror is exactly in the same position, what we call it the depth, we are going to have an interference signal. Okay, so then by scanning this mirror, we can have a depth resolved interference signal. Like in this example, maybe this one is a reflection from the top of the eye, and there might be a cornea, and we can have a, a back surface reflection of the cornea, and here might be the retina, and the retina pigment epithelium, strong scattering from the retina pigment epithelium here. Okay, it's just a, a depicted example. Okay, uh, in A, uh, the point of the optical coherence tomography is uh, it is a, a low coherence interferometer and uh, using the light interference to resolve the structure of the sample. Okay, that's the point. Low coherence interferometer and uh, resolving the sample of a uh, living animal, or living, including human. And in addition, we also can steer the light into lateral direction. And normally we are, uh, we are going to use a uh, say rotating mirror. We call it as a galvo, galvanometer or galvo. By combining uh, this lateral scan or transversal scan and this axial scan, we can have a uh, two dimensional re resolved um, cross section, a tomo say, okay, two dimensional tomography of the sample. And here is an example of a real patient of the macular hole. Okay. And actually, the OCT uh, was uh, quite popular in the ophthalmology, I mean, uh, eye clinic. Okay. And uh, it's quite, quite common now. And uh, I think almost all of the eye clinic now has the optical coherence tomography device. Okay. Then uh, let's go to the core part of the lecture. An introduction and a principle of OCT. And uh, first, uh, starting uh, to, to start or to kick off this lecture, first, I would like to classify the types of the optical coherence tomography. Uh, means OCT has uh, several subclasses. Okay. And then uh, by explaining it, I also give you a brief, brief history of the early times of the optical coherence tomography. OCT, uh, here is the OCT at the top of this hierarchy uh, can have uh, two subtypes. The first one is a time domain OCT, and the second one is a Fourier domain OCT. And a time domain OCT here is something, hold on. Time domain OCT is, uh, was, is, sorry, is uh, something I've explained in that picture. So uh, it's a low coherence interferometer, and uh, we, uh, we move the one of the mirror, we call it as a reference mirror by time and are taking a signal. Okay. And historically, this is called as a time, uh, this is called as an OCT, only OCT, not the time domain. So this means the first time of the, the epoch of the OCT was starting by this time domain system. Okay. It's a point detection system, means at the one time of the light detection, we can have an information of one point of the sample. It's a point detection system but uh, scan the location of the measurement by scanning the mirror and uh, staring the light. Okay, that's the point of the time domain OCT. It's quite simple and easy to understand for this perspective. Okay, there are a uh, little bit, say, complicated theory behind, but in anyway, the principle itself is intuitively quite easy to understand. Okay, um, but there is some drawback of the, the time domain OCT. It's a relatively low sensitivity and a long measurement time. Since it's a point measurement system, we need to scan the on. If you want to have a two-dimensional cross-section image, you need to scan the beam mechanically two-dimensionally. So it resulting in, uh, for example, to get a one cross-section, you need a 1.5 seconds. And the eye is always moving. So it's, uh, say, um, time domain OCD, uh, retina image of the eye is quite distorted because uh, during the 1.5 second scanning time, the eye is shaking, okay? And that was inevitable at that time. But uh, uh, around 2002, uh, we have a new uh, generation of the OCD technology. It is so-called as a Fourier domain OCD, this one, Fourier domain OCD. I'm going to uh, talk about a principle later, but a Fourier domain OCD is uh, 
one dimensional line detection system. So uh, its measurement time is fast, and also its efficacy of the usage of the probing is higher, actually 1,000 times higher than the time domain OCD. So it has a high sensitivity. By the combination of the high sensitivity and uh, high measurement time, and it say, realized the three-dimensional tomographic imaging of the eye. That's the second generation of the OCD, so-called as a Fourier domain OCD. And this Fourier domain OCD further, have, uh, further has two subtypes. The one is a spectral domain OCD, and the other is a swept source OCD. I'm going to uh, dig, in it, uh, dig in this spectral domain OCD later. But in, anyway, in short, the difference between the spectral domain and the swept source is uh, one, I mean, the spec, uh, sorry, the spectral domain OCD uses the spectrometer for the light detection, okay? And, uh, and on the other hand, swept source OCD uses high-speed wavelength scanning light source to have a spectrally resolved interference, interference here. Okay, and anyway, uh, I'm going to dig in it later. So then uh, let me give you uh, some brief history of the OCD. And uh, there is some prehistory of the OCD. Uh, we called, uh, normally we believe the epoch, the starting time of the OCD was 1991. And that was the first time, timing of the first publication of OCD uh, by James Fujimoto of MIT. But before this, uh, there are say something like a white light interferometer in general. And also Japanese professor, Professor Tanno submitted patent, something similar to OCD. And actually uh, that was qualified in Japan. It's a Japanese patent anyway. Okay, uh, but uh, there was some prehistories. Uh, they were, say, uh, struggling to do something with the low coherence light. But uh, there was a big leap in 1991 that was uh, made by David Wan and uh, James Fujimoto or Massachusetts General, uh, sorry, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Okay, uh, let, let, let's see it. So here it's a uh, reprint of uh, uh, image taken from the first publication of optical coherence tomography. It was 1991, maybe before your birth. Now on that time, I was still in high school, right? I was, I was young. Anyway, okay. Um, so there, they use exactly the same principle I've explained in a past slide and took the cross section of the pole sign I. Pole sign is peak, I of the peak. And even they found uh, this one is an uh, optic nerve head. An um, optic nerve head is uh, something like a structure at the bottom of the eye. And uh, uh, maybe uh, you, you know the word of blind spot. Okay, watching the front. And uh, maybe with this eye, you can see this. And sometime and the, your, your finger is going to be disappear okay, with a single eye, right? That's a blind spot. And actually, that the point, the blood vessels, blood tubes, blood vessels, and the nerve cords are going in and going out from or to the eye, okay? So uh, we cannot uh, put the photoreceptor there. We cannot see on that point. That's a blind spot. And this point is quite easily damaged by the uh, disease glaucoma. Okay, so it was actually a very important diagnostic point. So uh, they demonstrated by using optical coherence tomography, we can see the morphology or the structure of the optic nerve head. Okay, and this is the, the epoch or the first point, a big bang of the optical coherence tomography. Uh, but say, okay, this, this is fine, but uh, uh, what I'm interested in about this paper is actually uh, in the author list. Okay, uh, as I've explained, there are several prehistory of the OCT, including some Japanese activities. But uh, OCT became quite successful in states, not in Japan or the other countries. Why? Actually, even from this first paper, they clearly understood the main target of this technology is the eye diagnosis, eye measurement. 
Okay, so this means the uh, the biggest novelty of uh, this paper is the target and how they refine the low coherence interferometer to have a diagnostic information. And this can be evident that uh, from the target selection or the sample selection, they didn't measure the finger pad or meat or something, but they measured X of evil, that means an extracted eye still, not the eye. And the selected optic nerve head means they are from the beginning interested in a glaucoma diagnosis. And this also can be found in an author list, like a David Juan is an MD PhD for student on that time. And he is an ophthalmologist, eye doctor. Uh, on that time, he was a student, student of Massachusetts, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And at the same time, he was uh, studying in uh, um, HMS, Harvard Medical School. Okay, the MIT and uh, uh, Harvard are just uh, next to each other. It's a one station of the subway in Boston, and there is a river, right? But uh, even you can walk. And there is like a, a MIT remote campus in Harvard or something. Even, uh, they have a very close relationship. And uh, David, uh, on that time, was a student of Fujimoto, James Fujimoto. He's an optics lab. Uh, he's uh, the, the running the optics lab. But at the same time, he was studying to be a medical doctor. Okay, and he combined the laser technology and uh, the medical measurement. Okay, so this green, David one is MD, PhD, and the lead, uh, he, he is also MD, PhD student on the time. Okay, and uh, Eric Swanson was in Lincoln lab of MIT. He was, uh, uh, say, optical communication specialist. It's a very technology guy. And uh, Fujimoto, James Fujimoto, is a professor on that time. He was quite young on that time, but a uh, professor in MIT, laser lab. Maybe a uh, laser lab, no. Uh, no matter, I, I forgot the, the official name of that, but uh, uh, he was working for the Femsican laser on that time and that, uh, under the supervision of Ippen, Professor Ippen. Okay, and then Lin, Schumann, and Stinson, Chan and a common player fetal. All of them are medical doctors. So this means this past paper was organized based on a project that was from the beginning designed for the medical application. That is something I was really amazed by reading this paper. Okay, anything was planned at the beginning. That is something you need to think about. When you start your research, you need to think about this point. Anything is planned, but uh, maybe at the same time, they didn't that much aware about the situation become like this. Anybody in the world, anywhere in the world, we can see the OCT or something. It can be imaginable on that time, but uh, they believe they can do it. Uh, that is something you need to think of. Okay, in, anyway, uh, let's go to the trunk of this lecture. And that was 1991, the first time of the time domain OCT, but uh, uh, soon, uh, let's say, for seven years, uh, after four, seven years, we have a second generation of the optical coherence tomography. It is on that time, so-called a spectral domain OCT. So the time of domain OCT was a technology on which measure the interference signal directly. Okay, but a spectral domain OCT, before measuring the interference signal, we split the beam into each wavelength component by using spectrometer. So from this sense, it's not a broadband or local coherence interferometer, but uh, uh, each pixel of the spectrometer, it's a monochromatic, a monochromatic interferometer, right? For each pixel of the spectrometer correspond to a single wavelength. So it's a monochromatic interferometer. If this is a monochromatic interferometer, we cannot resolve the depth. So what's gonna be happen? Actually, we, virtually make the interference in a computer from the data obtained by the, the bundle of the monochromatic light, uh, monochromatic interferometers. I'm going to talk about it later. Okay, anyway, in 1995, um, there was a demonstration from, uh, okay, I have a slide for this. In 1995, uh, there was a demonstration from Professor Felcher, uh, sorry, it's a 1995, uh, Professor Felcher of uh, medical, uh, Currently, it's Medical University of Vienna, 
that on that time it was a part of the uh, University of Vienna. Okay, and then uh, after three years of this, um, George Heusler, Professor George Heusler of Erlangen, German, Germany, uh, demonstrated the first cross-sectional imaging by using the spectratum and OCT. Okay, and then it was after that it was quite quick. Uh, in 2003, and actually including uh, my own group, started uh, work for the retinal spectrum and OCT. And for example, Johannes de Boer, on that time he was in Mass General Hospital and the Harvard Medical School demonstrated fast in vivo retinal three-dimensional spectrum and OCT. And then at the similar timing, the Maciej Wojtkowski, and he was, I think, and actually Maciej was postdoc on the time in MID Fujimoto's lab, demonstrated the ultra high resolution on uh, human eye retina imaging by using a spectral and LCD. Okay, it's uh, only in a decade a bit, in a decade or a bit after the first epoch of the LCD, it was quite, quite quick on the time. And in American University of Vienna, Rhino Rhino Light Gap, Rhino Light Gap uh, demonstrated also the ultra high resolution. And also in the same group with Johannes de Boer, uh, Barry Sense, uh, in Harvard Medical School also demonstrated the ultra high resolution system. And actually uh, on that time, I was also working for the spectrum OCD and a clinical setup uh, in this university actually, and then transfer that technology to Topcon. And after two years, we have the world first uh, commercial device, a clinical device, which can be utilized for the um, eye diagnosis. Okay, anything was quick on that time and I was young actually. Okay, and then, Spectrum LCD are uh, quickly established, but there was uh, also another current in the world. It was a uh, uh, swept source OCD. And this was demonstrated by Andy Yoon of uh, Harvard Medical School. And he's actually the first Korean associate professor in Harvard. And it's a, he's a kind of national hero. Okay? And Andy is actually quite, quite smart. But uh, he was uh, originally uh, working for that uh, laser light source technology and uh, created a very partly on a rapidly a wavelength scanning light source by himself. Okay, and by using it, uh, he measure, he, uh, but using that kind of device, we can measure the interference signal uh, in a wavelength resolve, resolution manner and apply it for the Fourier domain OCD. And that is a swap source OCD. And 2003, in my understanding, is uh, something like an epoch of the swept source OCD. On that time, they didn't call it as a swept source OCD, but the OFDI, optical frequency domain imaging. Okay, uh, but in, anyway, uh, they demonstrated a very clear cross section of, uh, for example, this one is a finger pad, the skin, by their system. Okay, so uh, in anyway, on the OCD was uh, firstly invented in 1991, and it demonstrated by James Fujimoto of MIT, and after that, uh, it was quick, uh, quite quite rapidly progressed. Okay, and now uh, there are several inventions, and uh, maybe I can uh, I can revisit this point later in lecture five. But in, anyway, uh, the, the basement of the OCD was established something in early 2000. Okay, maybe uh, you are in, uh, say, something like a primary school or elementary school, hopefully. Okay, so then uh, let me explain a little bit something about a rather mathematical or the physical principle of the, the Fourier domain OCD. Okay, the time domain OCD, I just give you a brief idea, but for the Fourier domain OCD, actually this is the currently standard OCD system. So I would like to give uh, very details of the principle of the FD OCD, Fourier domain OCD. Okay, here it's uh, one example of the optical scheme of the Fourier domain OCD. And light source is a broadband light source. Okay, typically, uh, we, uh, we use um, semiconductor light source, like a super luminescent diode, SLD in short. Okay, it's a broadband light source and are uh, mostly centered at uh, 840 nanometer wavelength. And, and, and anyway, the wavelength selection, I'm going to revisit later. Okay, the light uh, from the super luminescent diode impinges to the low coherence interferometer. Okay, and the uh, interferometer, when you think of, of hard about the interferometer, maybe you can imagine something like a really bulky system, including a mirror and a beam splitter, or blah, blah, blah. But a modern interferometer can be built by using fiber optics. Okay, so here is a fiber, a fiber optical fiber, single mode optical fiber, and here is a coupler 
it's something like a beam splitter or half mirror. Half mirror, sorry. And a beam, uh, lit, uh, it, the beam from the light source is led to the coupler and split into two. Uh, this path and this path. Uh, one portion of the light is uh, delivered to the probe optics. It's on a collimator here and the light impinges to the rotating mirror. We call it as a Galvo mirror or Galvano mirror. And then focus on the eye, okay? Uh, for example, here, it's, uh, uh, with this setup, the technical screen with this setup, we will measure the coronia, not the retina. And anyway, and uh, uh, say focus on a sample and a scattered back and then going back to the coupler, okay? The other portion of the light is led to uh, this reference mirror. It's just a mirror. And they reflected back and going back to the coupler again. And these two beams are combined, recombined, and then is led to a high speed spectrometer. Okay, and the high speed, maybe you know the spectrometer, it's a combination of the, the diffraction grading and the lens and the first camera. And by using it, uh, you can take a spectral resolved, spectrally resolved uh, interference signal. Okay like this, and then applying a proper signal processing, we can have a depth, resol a depth resolved signal from the sample. Okay, I'm, I'm going to talk about that, what is the signal processing later. What the signal processing is, is uh, what the signal processing is later, okay. And then uh, the particular point of this setup is a reference mirror is not moving. In a time OCD, to take uh, this one-dimensional signal, we need to scan the reference mirror mechanically even. And it resulted in a long measurement time, but uh, we don't need to scan it now, okay? So alternatively, uh, or in addition, we can apply the transverse scanning by this rotating mirror. By this one-dimensional scan, we can obtain two-dimensional cross-section, okay? At the point of the Fourier domain OCD. Previously, in a time domain time, a time domain error, we need a two dimensional scan for the two dimensional imaging. But now we need only a single dimensional scanning to take a two dimensional cross section. Okay. Then, uh, why we can obtain this two dimensional cross section? Uh, let me start from a bit of mathematics. Here it's a uh, wavelength or k vector resolved interference signal. Okay, and uh, if you are interested in a uh, bit more of the mathematics, and actually uh, there are uh, some the online textbook I published. Uh, maybe I, I I will show that uh, uh, you are later uh, or in the next lecture. But in, anyway, uh, just in brief in this uh, say uh, verbal lecture. Above our lecture, okay. So this one is an equation of the, the light intensity obtained at the spectrometer. By the spectrometer, uh, we can resolve the light into the wavelength. But in this equation, uh, uh, more than the wavelength, I've used the wave number. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So you, you don't need to that much bother about this, okay? It's a wavelength or, or the uh, k vector wave uh, wave number resolved. OCT signal, the original one. Okay, and we have uh, three terms. This one is a, a reference beam. IR is a reference intensity. And this one is an interference of, uh, okay, this one is a in, uh, the reference beam signal intensity. And this one is an interaction between the interference, uh, uh, interaction or interference between the probe beam and uh, the reference beam, and it's a cosine, and the phase of the cosine is determined by the depth position of the scattering or the sample. Okay, and this one is a probe beam on the intensity of the probe beam, uh, and uh, interfered probe beam, and this one. Okay, so this one is an uninterfered reference beam, and this one is uninterfered on uh, the probe beam. A uh, probe beam in the uh, beam illuminating the sample. Okay, and uh, this one is uh, interference. The point here is this cosine term. Okay, in this cosine term, 
Vm is a depth location of the sample. Uh, technically, it's a relative depth location of the sample relative to the reference arm position. It's encoded as a frequency of this cosine term. Okay, so this means if we can know the frequency of this cosine along k, we can know the depth position. Uh, maybe uh, I skipped something. Okay, here is a cosine term. Uh, uh, normally, you can think Zm, Z is a variable, and a k is a frequency. Okay, but it's just a multiplication. You can swap your point of view. If you think uh, Zm is a parameter and a k is a variable, it is an equation of k, an uh, equation of the oscillation along k, and its frequency is in, proportional, uh, in proportion to Zm. Okay, it's just a swapping the point of view. This one at uh, this time can be understood as an equation of Zm. Uh, its frequency of is k, or its an equation of k, its frequency is proportional to Zm. It's the same. Okay, in any way, uh, if we can extract the frequency of this term, we can know the depth position of the sample. That's the point. Okay, uh, let me uh, let it break down. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, one additional point. So then, how can we extract the frequency of this signal? Okay, the one point, it's already digitized. It's taken by the spectrometer and acquired in a computer. And what we want to know is the frequency. So it's quite simple. We can apply the numerical free transform. By applying the numerical free transform, we can have a peak for signal, and its signal location is exactly the location of the sample. Okay, uh, I'm going to explain it later by using a, a simple diagram. Again, we, uh, I'm going to recapitulate it. I recapture it. Okay, so then Fourier transform. How we can do it? So here is the original equation, and we are going to Fourier transform it. Okay, and the Fourier transform is a linear transformation. So each term of this original equation can be considered or can be a Fourier transform. And the final Fourier transformation is a summation of all of the each uh, all of the Fourier transformations of each term. Okay. So then uh, now we have uh, three terms, but uh, in a uh, in a uh, after Fourier transform we have four terms. Okay. The first one is correspond to this guy, and it's a delta. Uh, it, it's a function. It here, oh, sorry. And this uh, in this first term here is a constant. Uh, the, but the function itself is a delta function at zero. Okay, so this one is a k equation, and this one is a z equation, the, and the Fourier pair of k, depth z. Okay, and uh, this one is a signal at the z equals zero point, and this is actually not important. And the lo localized at the zero point, so we can discard it, forget about it. And this term is a something like a noise. And uh, sorry, maybe this arrow is not correct. And this IP correspond to this guy, okay? And actually, uh, this is a little bit troublesome that uh, I'm going to talk about later, but uh, this signal is quite, quite weak. So again, we can discard it, forget about it. And then this cosine term is the most important one. Uh, by free transforming the cosine term, it is going to be split into two components. Okay, real and imaginary. Uh, okay, the cosine uh, by uh, by the Euler's formula, cosine has a uh, two components. Okay, the real and the imaginary. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. The cosine term can be split into the two exponential oscillation terms, one and the complex conjugate of it. It's the Euler's equation, uh, Euler's formula, right? And then each of them are going to be Fourier transform. And uh, exponential uh, oscillation is again Fourier transformed into the delta function. But the location of the delta function is decided by the frequency of the oscillation. Okay, maybe you can check the Fourier transform cosine Google. Uh, you can ask Mr. Google. 
but you can Baidu Isha, okay? And so now we have two terms. One is at ZM and the other is minus ZM, okay? Two terms and it is in proportional to the uh, pro beam power. Means we have a delta function and its height is proportional to the scattering intensity. The, scatter, the intensity of the scattering at a particular depth of ZM is, is appeared as the height of the delta function. And that actually the mechanism of the imaging of the Fourier analysis. Okay, it's a very, very quick uh, explanation. Maybe um, I, I believe uh, most of you couldn't catch it up, but if you're interested in it, uh, please check the, the, my online material. Uh, uh, you can Google it, uh, Yasuno's cabinet, and uh, I'm, I'm opened uh, something like a 20 page on say, textbook, short textbook of the OCD. And there I expound the details of the mathematics of this. Okay, if you're interested in you can check it. Okay, uh, but uh, maybe it's uh, kind to explain a little bit more, say, intuitively this, uh, this principle. So that's the point, okay, that's the, good, uh, the, that's the beauty of the lecture. Okay, uh, let's explain the mathematics by using a depicted diagram. So here, the input to the spectrometer or the output from the, say, local human interferometer. Check it. Okay, so here is the output from the local human interferometer and the input to the spectrometer, maybe somewhere here. Okay. And now uh, for this picture, we assume the broadband light source is a pulse. But uh, it is not necessarily pulse, but uh, uh, only for the, the explanation purpose or intuitive understanding purpose, please assume it's a pulse, pulse laser. And the pulse laser normally have a broad light source. It operates on, uh, say, uncertainty again. Okay, All of the short pulse laser has a broad light, a broadband light source. And uh, uh, as far as the phase of the spectrum is locked, you are going to have a short pulse. Okay, And if the spectrum bro is broad, and the phase of all of the spectral components are locked, you are going to have a very, very short pulse. It's a femtosecond laser, right? And, uh, but if the phase of the spectrum is unlocked or mixed uh, or decolated to each other, we are going to have a, a continuous wave, continuous wave. It's a continuous broadband light, okay? But uh, these two are essentially the same as far as we are working in a linear domain. Now, OCT uses only the linear phenomena, so there is no difference. But to intuitively understand, uh, understand the principle, it might be easy to imagine that uh, light pulse, okay? It's a kind of trick. Okay, so the output from the, the local human interferom interferometer is on, uh, it, like this. It's a time, and first we are going to have a reference beam, and after some, uh, after some delay, we have a probe beam, okay? And a probe beam has some shape in time. And this is uh, the structure of the sample, which is encoded in a time of flight manner. Okay, so if we can measure this, it is exactly the shape of the sample. So this is something we would like to measure, but it's uh, uh, varying very rapidly in time, and we cannot directly measure it. So we need some tricks. How we can do it? First, fully transform all of this signal physically. What this? The spectrometer, right? Spectrometer resolve the light into the wavelength component, the Fourier transform physically. But uh, we cannot actually measure the spectrum, but what we can measure is it, uh, the square intensity, means joint power spectrum of this signal. We can measure it and uh, digitize it and acquire it to the computer, and then apply the numerical Fourier transform, and we have this signal. So maybe your question is what the relationship with this final signal and the input signal. By watching it, and if you are carefully studying the mathematics, you can find that this is the Wiener Heating loop. Okay, you can check it, Wiener Heating Theory or Convolution Theory, nearly the same. 
So this means, okay, this signal is an old correlation of this original signal. Okay. And this old correlation contains the old correlation of the reference beam itself and the probe beam itself. It is appeared at the center. But at the same time, uh, by shifting the signal, okay, here is the reference beam and here is the probe beam, right? By shifting it like this, we are going to have a mutual correlation between the probe and the reference. It's actually the cross correlation. The cross correlation is contained in the old correlation. It's here. Actually, this is the OCD signal. It's uh, quite similar to the probe beam shape, but it's blurred by the reference. In some perspective, the reference beam here is actually on the point spread function, but uh, uh, this entire flow can give us a little bit blurred by the probe beam shape. That is something exactly actually what we want to measure, the OCT signal. So the point is, we didn't use any mechanical movement here, but we have the one-dimensional resolved OCD signal. That's the beauty of the free atom OCD. Okay, and then uh, I'm quite close to that, uh, the end of this lecture. Okay, then uh, after taking, okay, sorry, let me capture it. So we have the interference signal, uh, sorry, the output from the interferometer here and uh, uh, resolved uh, it into the wavelength by the spectrometer and then got the power spectrum and uh, in a computer we free transform it and then we have an OCT signal. And here is the OCT signal, okay, and take the, uh, the absolute square of this signal, it's here. And then normally uh, we take a 10 log of the uh, absolute intensity and uh, absolute square intensity is actually 20 log of the amplitude and we use it for the display. Okay, it's a kind of uh, interesting point. So uh, just maybe uh, I, I will close this lecture by uh, noting this point. Why we need this uh, conversion to log or dB. Okay, the signal itself is a complex signal, interference, complex interference, uh, interference signal. But uh, first we make it into square, absolute square, and then take log. Why? Actually, and, uh, this is because OCT has too high dynamic range. OCT sensitivity is something like 100 dB now. And also the image dynamic range can be um, like a very wide, and in principle it can be 100 dB. But human eye has only the contrast sensitivity of 200 to 300 ratio, ratio of 200 and 300. So we can distinguish only the 200 or 300 intensity levels. Okay, uh, it is something equivalent to uh, 23 to 25 dBs. So this means when you make an image for human observer, you need to compress the image range to within the human recognition. To do this, we apply the log conversion. It's a log, we call it also the log compression. Okay, and this is the final point of today. And I, and I love this point, but uh, this means the end point of the measurement system is not a display, but a human brain. Okay, anything uh, displaying the data is not the end. But you need to make it, or you need to bring it, or convey it to the observer's brain. To bring it to the observer's brain, it should be via the eye. And the eye has only the limited contrast sensitivity. We need to account for it. Okay, that is something very interesting point of the OCT and the, in general the imaging system. We need to think about the recognition and ability of the observe as human. Uh, by the way, uh, maybe the last lecture of 2021, you can find it in the YouTube, maybe lecture six is about this, the combination of the measurement and the human recognition and a, and a philosophical idea. Okay, if you're interested in, you can check it. 
OK, so uh, this is actually the, the last slide of today, and I would like to close this lecture. And as I explained at the beginning of the lecture, uh, actually, it, I, I'm going to open it in uh, uh, online later, and you can check it again. And also uh, from the next time, also I'm going to open uh, or the upload uh, the videos after the lecture. And uh, you, you can uh, come here. If, if you're interested in an in-person lecture, you can come here. But uh, if you're not, uh, maybe you can check the video later. OK, and uh, also uh, if the OCT lecture is too much specific for you, uh, you can check that uh, play, uh, the lectures of the last year or a year before the last year, and uh, you can submit the uh, reports and you can get uh, the lecture credit. credit. OK, there are three lectures ongoing and the one lecture ongoing and the two lectures are then done. And you can select uh, the uh, select one of it based on the interest of you, and you can submit the report, and you can get credit. Okay. So in anyway, uh, the details uh, of the report and uh, submission uh, or how you can take the lecture is going to be on uh, uploaded in the Teams, Microsoft Teams, and the team code will be distributed by Twins. Okay. So don't uh, if you want to uh, need a, the uh, if you need a lecture credit. Don't forget to uh, register yourself in the Twins and uh, check the announcement on the Twins. Okay. Okay, uh, any question, feedbacks? Okay. Okay, so then uh, let's close the lecture. Thank you, guys.